I was bored, you see, I was bored to tears of what the guys were fighting to say. I didn't think what they were fighting to say was worth anything. I was sick and tired of Bugs Bunny at that point, though it's great. I was sick and tired of the cartoons they were making. You know, but it was done over and over and over and over again. And it was tiring and boring and nothing new, like I said. So I immediately thought that anything different would get people excited. Cinema is an evolving process. It's a cycle of creativity. But often that creativity can get stuck in a mire of labels and conventions. As was the case with theatrical animation coming into the 60s and 70s, creativity needs experimentation to grow and to evolve. Animation, like everything else, has got to grow up. So to understand Ralph Bakshi's impact on animation, I think it's so, so important to understand where cinema was in the world at the time, as well as where animation was. So let's go back. Right about there. And let's fast forward. From the beginning of filmmaking, there were plenty of early experiments, of course. Then large studios were set rules and regulations as to what constitutes a motion picture. Italian filmmakers actually found stories away from the backlot sets and on the streets of their post-war cities. They brought a new realism to the screen. Then on top of that, French auteurs labeled the conventions of cinema and then went about to break every single one of them. Hollywood actually was afraid of the television and forced cinema into a giant sweeping spectacle of sweeping landscapes and dramatic epic stories. But the audiences began to drift toward the new ideas coming in from around the world. So a young group of filmmakers were given unprecedented freedom to throw their ideas in front of a camera and to create something people had never really seen before. Well, at least not on a screen. The reason why I'm explaining this is because similar movements happened in animation over the years, almost perfectly in sync with its live action counterpart. There was plenty of early experimentation, of course, and that led to studios setting down rules and ideas. Moving away from the rules set down by the studios, TV offered an experimental medium. But even as theatrical animation began to collapse with the rise of television, one stigma still seemed to cling to the medium. To what is jam. Make it kid friendly. It was because of Mr. Disney, you know, and he was so pure for children. I'm not putting that down, I'm saying. He was such an overwhelming force in America. Anyone that went against what he had ingrained that animation should be and our psychology and mind was automatically X-rated. And it still sticks with us, despite the prompting of industry giants. So how does Ralph Bakshi fit into all this? Well, honestly, who else could break the mold? I grew up in a time that was different, so it certainly affected my animation. Walt Disney, you know, spent the entire war years making his magical fantasy films. To him, there was no war going on. There was no Auschwitz. Um, so the way we grew up, the way we had to earn our living, the way we work, you know, what happened to our families affected the way I think. In other words, I didn't grow up in a, I didn't grew up in a small town in America where the leaves were falling down and we had Christmas every year. You know, it was a different kind of life. People would argue politics every street corner in my neighborhood. Ralph worked very hard in the industry, but he always wanted more. And after working at Terry Toons and directing successful shows, albeit on tight budgets, he set about creating feature animation. So I started to think about what I hated about the cartoons I'm looking at and why the studios should close down. In other words, there's no reason to keep stuff open that's boring. In other words, why do you need another Terry Tunes with a cat chasing the mouse in 1956? I mean, why do you need it? So unless you're doing something else, it has to go. Now, don't get me wrong. There was a lot happening in small pockets around the world that kind of prodded, poked, and tried new things. 
There were big shakeups in the industry at large, with Chuck Jones firing from Warner Brothers in 1962, Walt Disney's death in 1966, and the Hayes Code being abolished in 1968. Features of the 60s like gay puree and the colossal hit Yellow Submarine did challenge conventions and ideas of what the industry should be, but really they actually served as a beachhead for Ralph to charge in behind. With his first feature, Fritz the Cat, in one foul swoop, he challenged every seemingly established rule in animated stories, showing adult-orientated topics to adults. And not just physical acts of drugs or sex, violence and gruesomely true deaths, but also he spoke respectfully to his audience. Their face stuck in a bunch of books and their thumb up their ass. He drew on underground comics and depicted the artistry in life. Look at the strong colour choices in Fritz the Cat. Purples, greens, blood reds, and ash can style. He used skewered perspectives, fisheye lenses, realistic backgrounds, no perfect studio sound. Rather, he recorded people on the streets to fill out the verisimilitude of the scene. And the metaphors, my gosh the metaphors. Just look at Duke's death. As a pool player, each ball going slower and slower, matching his heart rate, until his reality shatters as he dies in a gutter. Though they were animals, he treated them with the same rules as humans. Birds couldn't fly, or else all the realism would be shattered. She... And you know what the best part was? He got the credit for his work. It wasn't a studio production anymore, not just another Disney flick. It was one name, which was a major change in animation. It allowed conversations to begin around his style and who he was. If I said, the hell with that, I'm just going to animate and try to make the story better, which I did. That's all I did. So I took Disney on because he locked and tied the hands of the industry for so many years. Look at what followed Fritz globally. Once it was released, literally the next year, more and more adult-themed animated features streamed in. He opened the floodgates. His second feature, Heavy Traffic, pushed the boundary further. By removing the anthropomorphized animals and dropped in real people, albeit caricatured, he brought his street life experiences to the animated medium, showing the unpredictability of life, much like a game of pinball. In the same way the daily reality of Scorsese's mean streets connected with audiences, so too did heavy traffic. When you make films about real things, they tend to stay around longer, and I like that. He also brought about a lot of unintentional changes. Because Ralph's hands were tied on his own small budgets, he developed techniques he'd use for later features, small little money savers. Firstly, there's no shadows. He didn't return for a lighting pass generally and painted shadows. I mean, there are absolutely none. <laughs> There were no pencil tests. Rather, he'd check the animation by flicking through as they drew. I worked very hard to change the business, break down Disney's bullshit, if you pardon the expression. The thing I fought very hard was Disney, who said you could only do it this way, you only needed the best animators, you only need a million, a million pencil tests to do something right, you only need the best voice recordings in the world, you only need the most money in the world. That's what would paralyze most of the industry. In other words, Disney paralyzed the guys by saying, unless you had all of this, you had nothing. And they bought into it. I mean, Ralph was shooting live action and mixing it into animation long before Roger Rabbit. He triumphed in skating criticisms of oppressive cultures. Um, fella. <laughs> oh, she got to clap. He understood sensitive moments. And 
And despite all the setbacks, meddling from studios and constraints, he made eight animated feature films over the course of 11 years. Which is crazy if you consider the turnaround of three to four years per film today. Though because he always had a super tight budget, it settled him into one of his more renowned techniques. Rotoscoping. Which to be honest, even he has mixed feelings about. But it helped him get a lot of footage through the gate. I come and go on rotoscope, but as an animation director, there was so much more I wanted to get in the faces and everything, which is so hard on rotoscope, so it gets me frustrated. He really settled on rotoscope for his first fantasy feature film, Wizards, which helped him achieve a lot of the battle scenes and set out actually a very particular style. Animation is both technique and story together. That's why I love animation. In other words, you have to find a style that tells you a story with impact. In other words, that's what's great about animation. They both are equally important. In other words, a great story without the right style will fall on its face. And a you know, and great style without the right story will fall on its face. When he released Lord of the Rings in 1978, it was criticized for its heavy use of rotoscope. But honestly, he didn't think he could do the story justice without a realistic style. You can't animate that realistically. You can't. From pure imagination, you can't. It's impossible. Um, so I decided to shoot the whole movie. I said, my God, this is it's the only way to do it. Once I, once I decided that, I knew I could do the movie. And honestly, I have to agree with Ralph. The style suited the material. Just look at Boromir's death. I'm sorry. Paid. Aragorn. Aragorn, go to Minas Tirith. Save my people. Aragorn. So poignant and subtle. His shift to fantasy films actually brought about one of the most important changes in how seriously animation was treated. And I've got to say, looking through the history of animation for a choke point of importance, I really think Lord of the Rings might be one of the most important animated features ever made. It really showed that it was possible to bring mature themes handled honestly into an animated feature. You don't always need gags to sell it to an audience. Lend me the ring. No, Boromir. No. Fool, obstinate fool! It is only yours by chance! It ushered in a quiet understanding of what was possible with animation, but also challenged the Disney model of what fantasy had to be. And boy did Wizards and Lord of the Rings lay foundations for an era of fantasy films. You know, my films weren't the family audiences. Um, they were very cheaply made, were really underground films. And uh, when I wasn't able to make him anymore, I quit. He did quit for a while, actually. Coming back and making some more features, as well as making the first animated TV series for adults. But I think the biggest impact he had was when he returned to make Mighty Mouse, The New Adventures. Here he comes, that Mighty Mouse. Even in its short two season run, it changed animated TV series forever. We all fondly remember 90s cartoons, but those who changed the industry actually seem to all work on Mighty Mouse. I don't think you could afford to put all the names in the same room now that, that, that came out of that first season. The creative freedom he gave those storytellers, animators and cartoonists was unprecedented at the time. I'll let the guys perform. And you know what? They perform above. They can't believe that they're free and they perform well. That's the major Bakshi secret. You hire talented guys and tell them not what to do. A lot of studios hire talented guys and tell them how to do it. It's mindless. It boggles the imagination. It's like hiring Norman Rockwell and telling him how to draw. They even took stabs at the formulas of the day. In Don't Touch That Dial, they even parodied Saturday morning cartoons by showing how bland it was. And then ended the episode with this message. But enough of this lying and hypocrisy. 
time for what television's really about. And then cut the ads. I mean, that's a whole nother level of genius. Changing how people saw the potential of animation after it had been shackled decades earlier allowed all these incredible young, talented artists to push themselves with their thoughts and ideas and in turn inspire new generations of storytellers and animators to think outside the box and say things they believed in. Ralph Bakshi is a fighter and he fought the corner not just for himself but those that would follow as well. I enjoyed saying something I believe in. I'm not always right, but I think that's the way filmmakers should make films. Um, I want to make them for adults and not children, and I don't want to make them for everybody. In other words, all films today are made so everyone can see it in America, all the animation, you know. All I want to do is be able to say some things and get them off my chest. Uh, the animation medium is perfect for that. I mean, it's the best in the world. People see Ralph Bakshi as a master of adult animation. And some thank him for opening the door for these amazing ideas, shows, artists and directors. And I think certainly that's true. But I think it's more important to remember that he didn't just make adult animation. That came about because he challenged the conventions, rules and cliches that animation had settled into. He saw the rules, broke them and in doing so opened the floodgates, bringing a wave of others with new ideas to deconstruct what was there and not be afraid to try new things. But I'd done what I wanted to do, uh, which is break the back of animation. I knew what I had. In other words, I knew that it was special for animation. And you've got to remember, these features were being produced at the same time as Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, American Graffiti, Star Wars, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Sleeper, Annie Hall, in fact, Wizards was originally titled War Wizards, but George Lucas asked Bakshi to remove War from the name as a favour to him because Star Wars was being released a month later. He was there as Hollywood changed and these incredible auteurs were given sole credit to their creation as well as how they changed the history of cinema. And in fighting for the artists, I think Ralph certainly deserves the same honour. Was I ahead of my time? No. Everyone else is behind. I'm not ahead. I'm doing what's right for an artist. He's doing what he believes in. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much again, as always, for watching. This is a bit of a big boy and a passion project for me for a while. It's really interesting actually going back through the history of cinema and animation just to see where things stand. So thanks again for watching. As always, animation is powered through Patreon. So thanks to all my patrons supporting me. Um, and if you want to get involved, Listen, there's a link in the description below. I look forward to seeing you there.